People of God, the Lord be with you. We welcome you to worship this day. Will you please stand and join me in our call to worship? Through Moses, God said, let my people go. In scripture, the law declares, in the seventh year, you must cancel all debts. With grace, Jesus said, give one coat away. With honesty, Jesus taught, sell what you have, give that money to the poor. Faith has always involved letting go, releasing, setting free, dropping our nets, giving to others, and following. So in this hour of worship, may we release that which binds us. May we worship with open, untamed, and poorest hearts so that we can walk freely with God. Let it be so. Amen. The epistle of 1 John reminds us that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In humility and faith, let us together confess our sin to God. Gracious God, We admit to holding tight to that which we know and understand. We put you in a box to avoid the shades of gray that come with faith. We put worship in a box to avoid the discomfort of change. We put ourselves in boxes labeled with gender expectations and societal norms. We put others in boxes labeled worthy and unworthy. We put all that we have in a box and pray we won't run out. So in this moment, we confess to holding tight to fear, greed, and worldly structures. Forgive us for missing the point. Open our eyes to a new way, to a holiness found in open boxes, unclenched fists, shades of gray, and holy release. Gratefully, we pray. 
Friends, hear and believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Let us pray. Almighty God, in you are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Open our eyes that we may see the wonders of your word and give us grace that we may clearly understand and freely choose the way of your wisdom through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our first lesson this morning comes from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. Listen for God's word to God's people. Every seventh year, you shall grant a remission of debts. And this is the manner of the remission. Every creditor shall remit the claim that is held against a neighbor not exacting it of a neighbor who is a member of the community, because the Lord's remission has been proclaimed. Of a foreigner you may exact it, but you must remit your claim on whatever any member of your community owes you. There will, however, be no one in need among you, because the Lord is sure to bless you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you as a possession to occupy, if only you will obey the Lord your God by diligently observing this entire commandment that I command you today. When the Lord your God has blessed you, as he promised you, you will lend to many nations, but you will not borrow. You will rule over many nations, but they will not rule over you. If there is among you anyone in need, a member of your community in any of your towns within the land that the Lord your God is giving to you, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted toward your needy neighbor. You should rather open your hand, willingly lending enough to meet the need, whatever it may be. Be careful that you do not entertain a mean thought, thinking, the seventh year, the year of remission, is near, and therefore view your needy neighbor with hostility and give nothing. Your neighbor might cry to the Lord against you, and you would incur guilt. Give liberally and be ungrudging when you do so, for on this account the Lord your God will bless you in all your work, and in all that you undertake. Since there will never cease to be some in need on the earth, I therefore command you, open your hand to the poor and needy neighbor in your land. The word of the Lord.
Sometimes texts like that can preach for themselves. <laughs> Our second lesson this morning comes to us from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 19. Listen for what the Spirit may be saying to us this day. Then someone came to him and said, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to them, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. He said to him, Which ones? And Jesus said, You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother. Also, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, I have kept all these. What do I still lack? Jesus said to him, If you wish to be perfect, go, sell your possessions, and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. And when the young man heard this word, he went away grieving, for he had many possessions. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Anybody want to take my place up here this morning? This is a hard sermon to preach because these texts are bound to our identity. When we talk about our identity, our inner lives, our secret places of where we rest our sacred worth, we are talking about something very personal. And for many of us, very private. It's hard to talk about these things because we really don't want to be that guy. You know, the one who gets it wrong. The one who gets caught up in all of the consumer glitz and always needs the next best thing, whether it's a car, a tool, a pan, those socks, or maybe even a vacation. We all try our best to be faithful. I don't doubt that for a minute. And I think we're all doing the best we can with where we are. And at the same time, Concurrently, these texts invite us to take a little deeper into the story and examine our hearts with tenderness and honesty and to peer a little more closely into those things that still may be holding us captive and invites us to let go and to lean in to God. Last week, we remembered right? We remembered that God is enough and always has been enough, and that makes us enough. What do you need to release to embody that more fully? The Old Testament law that, that Bill read required the Hebrew people every seven years to let go of all of the debts that were owed to them. Money, land, whatever. If, and if you were the debtor on the other side of that, you were released from what you were to repay. The debt was canceled. Now, surrounding this text, there are many more provisions that get into very specific detail about that entire year and how they were to go about this canceling of the debts, which includes also the resting of the land. The people were called to let the land rest and debt go and re rely solely on God's care. The call really was to free yourself as well as free others from what was holding them captive and enslaved. There's actual evidence that this has been practiced over the past few millennium, including including and particular to Jews who live in 
right now, the nation of Israel. How many of you have heard this text before or heard it been referred to? Okay. It's a pretty radical thing. One that in principle is really admirable, right? And generous. But how would our society function, one that ebbs and flows by a market, how would it work if debt was canceled and the land was rested? Now, I'm no economist, thank God, but I'm not sure that would work too well. But let's hold on to that principle, for it's brilliant and it's full of hope. It's full of the values that we articulate and claim as people of faith. The practice illustrates generosity, liberation, forgiveness, and rest. What do you need to release? It's same with that young man in the Gospel of Matthew, who was really a good guy, right? He followed the commandments, and he was prepared for Jesus. He had all of his I's dotted and his T's crossed. He didn't murder or steal and honored his parents. He did all the things, all of them. But he couldn't let go of that one thing that truly held his identity, his possessions. And yes, Jesus really did say that. Give it all away. Because Jesus doesn't want our leftovers. Jesus wants all of me, all of you, all of who we are. And that includes all of our stuff. To be aligned and utilized for the kingdom, for God's beloved community, generous and free. And what was the man's response? The man was overcome with grief. Grief. I paused for a long time on that word when studying this passage. On the feeling of not being able to follow through on what your faith asks of you. And I tried to recall when my heart had felt that grief. We've all had that fleeting feeling, right? That moment when I knew that something was being asked of me that I was to give, to be open to God's calling, to forgive, to be generous, to let go of something that I thought was grounding me but betrayed God and myself because I couldn't follow through with it. I was too captured by my own need for a false sense of identity. Because if I did follow through with what was being asked of me, I'd have to step down into the unknown and really trust God. Those moments are poignant. They're hard easy to blink and pretend that they didn't happen because that which we falsely grip to for security is stuck to us like super glue. And to release ourselves from its grip is likely to cause pain. What do you need to release yourself from in order to be able to live the life that God is calling you to? New Testament scholar Luke Timothy Johnson writes, Our every instinct as humans is toward idolatry and protect our own projects and possessions. But God calls us to a larger and more frightening space. God's own creation revealed to us in the others we encounter every day. When we obey the call to faith, 
to an openness to God as disclosed through God's creation and let go for the moment of all of our projects and our possessions by which we want to define ourselves. We experience both the thrill and the terror of freedom. Johnson is right. Imagine what it would be like if we weren't a people held captive by making our stake, our claim in this world, but rather released that which held us back. The need for security, for happiness found in, now I'm being facetious here, happiness found in that great moisturizer or the latest version of Alexa or that really great pair of shoes or fill in something you spend a lot of time consuming. Maybe even your way of life. One theologian put it radically once in a sermon that I heard, saying that, what if we all just lived in our garages, which are larger than most of the world's homes, and got rid of our houses? What type of burden would you be released from if you didn't have to have an entire house to keep up, to furnish, to pay for, and in case, my case, clean? More intently, would you be able to serve God and embody God's call to love others? But that's for next week's sermon, reimagining how we can be stewards of God's world. How thrilling and how frightening release into freedom is. To let go of a political side, a club, any allegiance that grounds you, anything that we put stake in, because we think it makes us something more than what we were before. And that without it, I would risk having to lean into God rather than the security of a false system I have lived my life trying to make myself a part of. How thrilling and how terrorizing such decisions are. That is the release that God desires of us. And I believe those decisions are not the same for everyone, and they look different for each of us, but the core of this practice is to be released from what holds you captive. To release and be free and belong only to God. To rejoice in the simplicity of that and the ability to not worry about keeping up with the Joneses, but rather rest in your identity as claimed and loved by God and to build something from there. I don't know what you have your grip on this day. But I know what mine clings to. And I'll continue to pray my way through that. And I hope that you will join me in prayer and commitment. Real freedom is releasing what we have falsely staked our identity in. For freedom is actually not about generosity itself. In fact, it's not about the giving at all, but rather, it's about you letting go of what holds you captive so that you can then turn to be free, to be who God has made you to be. Release and let go. God is waiting.
As we come to pray, we share the joys and the concerns of our community of faith. Um, I ask your prayers this day for um, Nancy Thomas, who has been in hospice care for quite a while at Birch Haven um, and continues to decline. She, however, was exposed to COVID um, this past week by an associate and now needs to be in isolation for the next two weeks, um, which really stinks, especially for Larry, who wants to be with her. Um, so we ask for prayers for her um, and also for Larry um, as he needs to be away from her at this time. And we lift all those who continue to struggle um, during this time with illness. I invite you now to share the joys and the concerns that you may have. Yeah, we pray for all those who were hit by the um, hurricane that came through, um, many of whom who had not recovered from the last one. Um, so prayers um, for them, and may we offer hands um, and feet as, as is needed. Yes. Yeah, Dee. Go ahead, Dee. <laughs> Remind me your son's name again. Yeah, Rem tell me your, I didn't hear your son's name again. I always forget. Crane. Yep, got it. So um, Dee's son, Kyle, has been recovering. It was a foot injury, wasn't it, or a leg? Um, for the past three years. Um, it has finally been cleared to go to Crane School. So she asked for prayers for herself <laughs> um, as he will be up on cranes um, learning how to um, do all of those. So prayers for Kyle and for you, Mama. <laughs> Other prayers? Well, let us turn to our God in prayer. I invite you to join me in a bidding prayer uh, this day when I pray, Lord, in your mercy. I invite you to respond, hear our prayer. We thank you, O Lord, for all who have taught us the faith and who teach us still to be faithful. We pray that you would continue to guide the church in yet another time of change and tension and challenge. Help us to trust in you so strongly that we are willing to take risks for the gospel, even if in risking we grow uncomfortable or afraid or uncertain. Release us from what holds us captive, that we can be illumined to serve you in all we do. Give your church wisdom to discern your ways. Never let us be satisfied with comfortable pleasures or easy answers. We bring you the concerns and cares of the world around us, we pray for those who long for freedom and justice, for safety and sustenance. We pray for those who write laws and for those who enforce them. We pray for our military and for those who seek to liberate and defend. We pray for people caught in unjust systems. We pray for all who live daily with food insecurity and job insecurity and peace 
insecurity. We pray for those who are in harm's way today, whether the threat is from natural disaster. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We bring you the cares and joys of our own lives. We pray for those who are celebrating a time of newness and renewal. We pray for meaningful work to do and good colleagues to journey with us. We pray for those who need healing and hope as they journey through difficult times. For those who are contending with Ill illness, isolation, or fear. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We do not cry out this day in desperation, O God, but in hope. For you are just in all your ways, and you hear us when we call upon you. Pray that in us, Holy Christ, you would indeed find rich faithfulness. In the strong name of Christ, we pray this day. We pray the prayer that he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we turn to leave worship, um, we are, it almost feels like we're kind of starting up again today, which is exciting. Um, we have the community dinner um, today um, with all of um, social distancing protocols um, in place. Um, but for our neighbors in need who are often even more isolated, we feel like we can provide a safe place for them um, to eat and to be in community. So um, please join uh, 11 o'clock. So 1230 um, down in the great room, there's also carry out um, if that is the way you would prefer to eat as well. So um, but before that, uh, we are starting up again adult seminar and uh, character builders. Um, the adult seminar today is going to be a report and invitation from stewardship and finance. Many of you, uh, you all should have received um, your pledge card and just information about the budget that we're asking for to, for 2020. So if you'd like to hear more. Uh, please join P.J. Uh, Milligan in Fellowship Hall. And then character builders are in 209, correct? 209. Um, so join either of those groups today after worship. And I think Clint has a few words about our last song. So the trees of the field will clap their hands. The trees of the field will clap their hands. Okay, you get that, and you've got all your noisemakers, so even though we're not supposed to sing, which I hate, we're going to make noise, so make noise. So let's stand and do our closing here. of 
joy and all the trees of the field will clap will clap their hands and all the trees of the field will clap their hands the trees of the field will clap their hands the trees of the field will clap their hands while you People of God, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, may the love of God, and may the power of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forever, and go out into the world with peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted and support the weak. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. 